And if you're listening to this and you're not subscribed, what you doing, baby? Hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify, give us a follow. We have a great guest on the podcast today. She's a musician, a TikTok creator, the owner of a very cute dog, and just released a new single called Michigan. You can find her on Alexis Leanna on TikTok and Instagram. Please welcome Alexis Garcia. What is up? Thank you for having me. I'm super pumped to be on here. Firstly, your dog, Cricket, is adorable. She's the best, yeah. You've shot videos, like a lot of videos with her in them, and like she seems like the sweetest dog ever. She she is odd. I And this is like, I know I have a very biased opinion, but she has the most awkward personality Oh, uh, I've literally never met a dog like her, but I feel like we're two peas in a pod and uh, yeah, she's the best. Two awkward beans. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> Just so the listeners know, I, when I had reached out to Alexis and I said, Hey, I would love for you to be on the podcast. She was like, cool. She goes, Just to let you know, I'm an awkward bean. <laughs> Yeah, there's probably going to be some awkward moments on here. I was like, awkward bean, it's all good. This is a podcast. We can edit it. I also saw that you recently just bought a house. Is that correct? So so kind of. So my sister and I, we, we're out here in Vegas, and we, we bought a house out here. So yeah, it's been nice. I finally got Cricket her dream yard. So that's amazing. <laughs> You're doing good for your little fur babies. I've got to. Got to make a good life for her. That's awesome. I, I saw that and I was like, man, because like I'm in, um, I, don't, I think you're 25. I'm 25. Yeah. Um, and so I've been kind of in that stage of like, oh shit, like I, I need to be starting to look at houses and like yeah. building up, you know, credit and all of that stuff. And I've been looking at that. I'm a few years off from it. But when I saw that, I was like, damn, that looks nice. I want a music yeah. room. Like I want that <laughs> shit. That's cool. Yeah big adult moves. It's crazy. I still feel like I'm 16, but I know me too, especially with TikTok, <laughs> especially with me. <laughs> um, I don't know if you feel like this, but like, I, cause I've moved back in with my parents and just cause it's easier like with COVID. And so like the, I, I felt more of an adult before, but I still wasn't, but now making TikTok videos and my old childhood bedroom is just a whole nother level. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I get, I get embarrassed cause all of my like nieces, uh, they're all on TikTok. And so I feel like it's super like, you know, like their generation. And so when I'm like doing all these trends and I'm seeing they're doing the exact same thing, I'm like, oh my gosh, like what has my life come to? I know. <laughs> what has quarantine done? I have like a 10 year old cousin and she's been on it since it was musically. And once I got on it, like it was, it was just so funny because I had seen some of her stuff that she did before and everything. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, like this is, this is the, <laughs> this is my new life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I saw that you did a TikTok in your house and you had a, a whole room that you dedicated to music and you did a whole video putting up everything together. Like, what was that like to be able to have like a room dedicated to your to your passion? So pumped. Uh, I've always, you know, lived in apartments. So I just have my own little small bedroom. Uh, and so it's like, yeah, it's always been a dream of mine to just have a room where I can work, I can make music. Um, and so it was super exciting uh, just to see it all come together and have a space for my keyboard, my guitars. Um, yeah, it definitely, definitely felt good. And it's a nice little place, you know, to, to woo the ladies. <laughs> 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 just kidding. Social distancing, guys. Come on. I need to know about how you're wooing the ladies with their music room. Just kidding. I'm not wooing any ladies. Ladies. Uh, they're wooing me. How about that? They're wooing you. Oh, yeah. no way. <laughs> awesome. But yeah, the music room is super cool. I'm super pumped about it. Um, yeah, it's just a nice little getaway place to, you know, be able to let out all emotions and kind of wind down. So. That's cool. I think that's funny that you said that you weren't moving the ladies. I feel like I could see you on the keyboard making a rap. <laughs> yeah. Someone sends you something cute and you're like, I'm going to rap about you. This is how I'm going to get you. Yeah, I'm like the gay version of Taylor Swift. I will write a song about you if you break my heart. So. <laughs> At least they know when they're signing up to, to be with you that they know that this is an option. If they screw up, like there's going to be a song out. And, and they're going to know it's about them. So <laughs> like paperwork on the first day, just be like, Hey, just let you know, I might write a song about you later. Um, yeah. so, you know, tread lightly, <laughs> yeah. be kind, be kind, be kind to me because I might not yeah. be kind to you in my next single. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Speaking of singles, 
You have a new song that just dropped, first single you've released. It's on Spotify. It's called mm -hmm. Michigan. Yes. It's it's amazing. I listened to it. I saw when you had um, put it out. I don't know if it was on Instagram or TikTok, but I saw that you had put it out, and I was like, this is fucking awesome. Like, I love listening and, you know, appreciating, like, queer musicians and queer mm -hmm. art and stuff like that. So I listened to it, and I was like, this is freaking dope. Like, this is a good song. Like, how yeah. did you feel – like releasing your first single. I was absolutely terrified. Um, I will say like my singing voice is, it's pretty average, if not below average. Like it's, it's, not, it's not the best, but to me, like music is so important. It's a way for me to process emotions, um, release them, convey them. And so anytime I'm kind of going through something, I pick up my guitar and it's a way to kind of just like process through that. Basically all my music is sad. My mom was like, Lex, like next time you write a song, I need you to listen to the song Happy by Pharrell. Your songs are so sad. Everyone's going to think you're depressed. I'm like, well, like what if, what if I am a little depressed, you know? And so, yeah, it was crazy releasing it. It meant a lot. It brought me back to a, a place, you know? And so, um, super happy, super pumped to have it out now. I've had people from all over like, message saying that their song kind of or the song helps um them process through emotions um there's even a girl that reached out saying that her and her ex had broken up and her ex was from michigan so it really helped her process through those feelings as well and so that and that's my goal my goal is to people can relate and connect and it's a potentially serve a purpose in that sense so i love that I absolutely yeah. love that. Even if you only write sad songs, like people <laughs> are sad. Like you get in states where you, you're sad and you're looking for that relatable music, you know? I feel like the same way with me, not that I make music or anything like that, but every time I'm in like a sad state, I always attempt to write poetry and I never write poetry if I'm <laughs> happy. Totally. Like, <laughs> It's only when I'm sad and I'm in like the depths and it's usually it's not even just a typical sadness or like anything like that It's like anything relating to women in any capacity that makes me sad. That's the only time that I write poetry Yeah, heck yeah. No, I, I feel that on such a deep level. It's the only time where I can crank out some really creative shit Yeah, I mean those emotions are strong. Yeah, like they're they strong emotions. So it's they really it's are. like it's often easy to be able to put them on paper, so. Sapphic poetry, like, <laughs> yeah. it's the most intense form, I think. Yeah. Well, I want to get into a little bit more about, like, your music and stuff like that, because I know that you can play a few different instruments. Um, how did you get involved in music, and what's kind of, like, the inspiration behind the stuff that you make? My mom, as a kid, she had me in piano lessons, uh, and so, yeah, I played piano as, as long as I can remember. Um, I had some pretty intense piano teachers, I will say that. I remember there was one piano lesson where my teacher, um, I didn't practice that much that week. And so when I got to my lessons, I was pretty rusty. And at one point he stood up, he grabbed my piano books. He, and, and I gotta say, I was like in third grade, maybe. He grabbed my piano books, he threw them to the ground. And he was like, I don't know what's wrong with you. You're either stupid or you don't like playing piano. Cause this is like garbage. And I'm like, Third, third grade, like I was little. Wow. Um, yeah, so had some pretty intense music teachers uh, growing up. Um, but since that, I've always just had this like connection to music. Um, I got my first guitar in about fifth grade. Uh, I was horrible. My family, I think that was their biggest regret was getting me that guitar because I was so bad. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I was pretty bad. And so I actually put the guitar down for a few years because I was like all discouraged. Like I get upset with myself when I'm not good at something right away. And so, yeah, I put the guitar down and it wasn't until um, probably like eighth or ninth grade when I picked it back up and I uh, started teaching myself guitar, um, got better, which was cool. And then writing has always been a thing. It's always been an out for me. And so just to kind of combine that and be able to like combine music and writing kind of came together there. So yeah, it's always been a big part of my life. I'm like the only one in my family that does music though. My, the rest of my family is pretty bad, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. I mean, it makes you unique. Like I, I play the drums and I grew up playing in like band and jazz band. I was a band nerd. 
and nobody else besides like my grandpa was like a self dot guitarist band he plays banjo plays harmonica but it didn't get picked up by any of the family like we're just like a very sporty family but not really any like artist or anything like that I ended up playing and I, I felt the same way like I had always loved like drums I'd always loved anything related to that and I never really got into writing anything because it, it was always rhythm based I never played any yeah. melodies or anything drums are cool I bet you you've had some times where you could uh let out some anger on the drums oh for sure yeah yeah yeah, um, it's like the worst instrument to have. Like, if you're <laughs> yeah. a parent, like you don't want your kid to be a drummer. Like, yeah, right. Yeah. What kind of inspires your music? Like, what has inspired Michigan? Like, I I listened to it, and I know that you kind of said that it was from like a, a harder time in your life. Like, what kind of inspired that? Yeah. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into it. So I hope she never hears this. I dated a girl. You dated a girl? <laughs> oh, I know, right? What the heck? No, three years. Uh, her and I were together, and she was from Michigan. Um, and I'd only been to Michigan once, but unfortunately, the relationship kind of ended abruptly. It was the worst heartbreak I'd ever gone through. Uh, took probably over a year to even feel normal again after that. Um, but yeah, after that breakup, I kind of wrote Michigan as a way, like like I said before, to kind of process what was happening. Um, and then at the end, the last lyric is um of the song is Michigan uh I, I guess it's time to say goodbye maybe I'll see you another time so it was it was kind of a way for me to at the beginning process through all these emotions and then at the end kind of come to a point where I can close that book and and kind of be appreciative for the relationship but know that for my heart I need to say goodbye and let go uh, it was a tough time but um it's kind of fun being able to release that song and now be in a place where I've grown and healed from that and to listen and I'll be appreciative of where I was at about a year and a half ago. So that's beautiful. I love that turning pain into something creative, into an outlet to help other people. And I, I always am a big proponent of like channeling that energy, like whatever that energy is into something constructive. And it also feels like a sense of accomplishment as well as closure, just because you were able to create something out of, you know, something that was really tough. And then to be able to share that with other people and get closure in your own personal life at the same time. Cause like closure is like everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely like need to take time for your heart to heal after stuff like that. So yeah, I'll be releasing an EP hopefully I'm thinking early July, but a lot of the songs were written during, during that time I was healing after that breakup. So it's kind of a heavy EP, but uh, it'll be cool. I think a lot to connect to. You know, if you're the person that just puts out sad music, like it's all good. You don't be, don't be insecure. Don't let your mom say make happy stuff too. Cause like, what if your happy stuff is terrible because you're so happy that you don't really put as much into it. Cause you're like, I'm fucking totally. happy. Why do I have to make this song? <laughs> yeah. If I'm happy, I'm not stuck in my room writing music. I'm like out doing stuff. So <laughs> me too. I'm not writing poetry when I'm happy. This is for all the sad, sapphic gays out there. If, you, if you're listening to this episode, this episode is for you. It's for all the sad, for all the sad queer folks out there. Here you yeah. go. Yeah, exactly. So um, I also saw on TikTok that you've been collaborating a little bit with some other TikTokers and like duetting and doing some rapping on TikTok. <laughs> Uh, tell me a little bit more about that because like the, like the fans go hard for that shit. Like they eat that shit up. Yeah. I, um, the first one I did, I, I was nervous about posting it. Cause I was like, oh man, I'm going to get roasted for like this girl trying to rap and she's not even that good at it. And so the first rap I did was I'm sure a lot of the, the people listening, the, the gay TikTokers have seen Reagan's page. And she was doing, I, I think you know about it too, she was doing this whole crew thing where she wanted to create a crew of other um, TikTokers. And so she had like these qualifications on like who can be a part of it. And then people would tag who they wanted to be in this crew. And so I knew she had an extensive list. Like she had a, a huge list of people that, that could be in this crew. And I was like, how do I stand out to be in this crew? So I was like, perfect. I'm going to write her a rap. And so yeah, wrote her a rap and yeah, people, I, I did not expect that video to like do as well as it did. But um, yeah, after that I was like, okay, 
I kind of see what the people like. And so, <laughs> so I did, I did one again. And then, um, I did a duet as well where I, I wrote a rap cause I, I'm not super confident yet to like sing on video. I don't yeah. know. Just, I'm not there yet. Um, but rapping, I'm like, heck yeah, it's like lighthearted. It's fun. And so, yeah, I've just been enjoying doing that and people seem to enjoy it. So, you know, it's been cool. It's been fun. Yeah. People go hard for those raps. I saw that, the one that kind of took off with regs, because I was was so funny. I got tagged in it, too, and at the time, I only had, like, 17K, and I was like, oh, my God, if I can be the token small creator, like, <laughs> sign me up. Guys, if you're loving this episode and getting value out of it, please drop us a review on Apple Podcasts. This helps us get discovered by more queer listeners just like you, so we can get this in the ears of people who are looking for some cool, relatable gay content. Um, also, if you are on Spotify, give this a follow. Uh, again, if you're loving this, reviews are much up appreciated. All right, guys, question for the queer segment. Uh, this is part of the podcast where we try to answer your questions on life, love, happiness, etc. that uh, we probably know have no business trying to answer. This question comes from one of Alexis's listeners. She asked, what was it like uh, coming out in a non-affirming church? For those of you who don't really know my story, um, I was incredibly involved in a church uh, through middle school, high school, and college. So I will start by saying my family is not super religious. We are Catholic by culture is what I say. (laughs) The drinking Catholics, the Catholics that can drink. (laughs) Exactly. That is 100% defines my family. Um, And so I, in middle school, I took the initiative to get involved with the church on my own. And so um, yeah, I went to this church for about eight years. I was incredibly involved. And when I say incredibly, I mean incredibly. Um, I would probably be with my church people about four to five days of the week. I was um, on leadership. And so um, I think a lot of people that have come out kind of know in their heart, like, uh, you know, I definitely like my friends more than friends. And uh, for me, that was like so difficult just because my, I, I, I was told by, by the church, you know, like being gay is sin, you're going to go to hell. And so that was ingrained in me. And so coming out was incredibly difficult just because um, I genuinely felt like there was something wrong with me. And so after, when I started dating this girl in, in college, was when I was starting to come to the point of accepting myself and coming out to my church family. Um, And unfortunately, they did not take it well. Um, I was told by the church that uh, I had to choose between Jesus or my sexuality, that I couldn't have both. Um, I was told it was a phase. I was told that they were praying for me, that my desires would change. Um, I was also one time told that it was okay to be gay as long as I don't act on it. So it was okay to have these feelings, but basically they're telling me you're never allowed to, to be in a relationship or, or be with someone. And so that was very disheartening. My best friend at the time, she told me, Lex, it's hard to be your friend because you're actively choosing sin. And so it was, it was the hardest thing. It was so difficult um, just because being, being coming to a point where I accepted it, and decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to be who I, I was made to be, I lost all my friends, all of them. So I was, I was pushed out by, by them. I was deleted on Facebook. I, I was in a small town, so whenever I would see them in public, they literally would turn their heads as if they didn't know me. Um, and it was difficult. When I came out, I was the exact same person. I had the same values, the same beliefs, the same, the same heart. The difference was is that I was honest about who I was. I wasn't hiding anymore. And so for them to not accept me simply because I was now being honest was very disheartening. Um, I was asked to step down from leadership. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was a difficult time. But um, I think but is my favorite three letter word because, <laughs> because there's it shows that there's more like that's not the mm-hmm. end that's not the end of the story you know and so um now I've come to a point where I am surrounded by the best people in the world um I have experienced love I have experienced heartbreak um which has made me grow into the person I am I have super supportive family 
And I've done my research. I've, I've done a lot of research in terms of uh, what, like homosexuality and religion. And I have come to a point where I 100% genuinely believe that what I'm doing is not sinful, that I can kiss girls and I can love Jesus and Jesus loves me. And so um, it's cool coming to a point where I can be confident in that and knowing in my heart that, you know, this is who I am, this is how I was made. And I'm now at a point where I'm surrounded by a ton of people that love and support me. And I hope that my story can also help other individuals who may be in that situation to come to accept themselves and, and know that they are worthy of love. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them and they're enough and they don't need to change. So, yeah. I love that perspective. And I love that message that you're sending out to everybody because not everybody you know, can come out and like in that kind of place and have like an affirming church and have those kind of things. And like, even though that experience I'm sure was incredibly painful and it, it's nice to know that you're not alone and that's, and, um, and you can move forward and still have that faith and not be, not leave that behind. Um, and like you said, like nothing had changed for you. Like it, you were the same person but the people around you, they did change, but you never changed. And I think that's the big thing to take away is that like coming out isn't a super big change for you. It might be for other people because you've had that time to process. You, you knew that whole time, right? And then it took those other people and whether they want to process it or not is, is on their own thing. But like you're on your own tra trajectory, just like all of us. And, you know, becoming who we are authentically and if people don't support that then they don't deserve to be in your life totally totally I 100% agree with that yeah yeah it's and it was definitely eye-opening to just see how conditional where where on Sundays they would talk about unconditional love and, and living like Jesus but then their love for me was so conditional um which was which was definitely upsetting but it's like I said it's cool to be in a spot now where where I can be surrounded by loving people and also kind of, you know, be a voice for others and, and help, help others kind of, you know, process through that as well. Cause it's not easy. It was hard. It, it took, it took a lot of time to kind of come to terms with it. Well, you're out on the other side. Welcome. It's amazing over here. <laughs> grass <laughs> is greener. <laughs> it is. <laughs> the grass is gayer. I think that the, your message is good for a lot of people because I do think that a lot of people shy away from the church being in the queer community because of just the history of being ostracized and being called out and all of the awful things that have happened to queer people over the course because of religion. And it has turned a lot of people away. It, it definitely was like that for me. Um, mm -hmm. My parents are Methodist, which Methodists aren't too bad. They actually almost, they just had a thing last year where they almost voted that we were cool and it almost won. Yeah. So that was, that was a step in the right direction. And my parents are like very, they're supportive and everything like that. But yeah, I, they helped start a church when I was from like third to sixth grade. So I had that um, upbringing where they were part of the you know, inner first people of this church or whatever. And I saw just kind of the stuff that went on. And even as a child, I just was like, I don't know about this. Like, I don't think these people are nice. And they kind of did my parents really dirty. And I was like, I'm definitely not doing this. Like, this sucks. And I had a best friend whose dad was a pastor. Um, they were bap they're Baptist. And it had gotten to the point where she was kind of straying away from all of us anyways. But when I she had left when we were all hanging out and that's when I came out to my other friends and I didn't even want to come out to her because I just didn't feel like she even deserved to know. And I didn't want to see her response or reaction. Cause I just, I knew that she wasn't going to be in my life anymore and I was already evolving. Um, so I didn't want to go through the pain of seeing that rejection. Even if you're religious or not religious, like, that stuff can can hurt and I had been friends with her for so long and I knew her thoughts on it so even before I knew I was gay like and started having these feelings like you know just like people and saying things like that it gets ingrained in you and it's totally. just it can be toxic 
yeah, having to have process through that, and I'm sure you you get that too. Like, it's it's cool to now kind of be on the other side. What you're going through, like your your feelings are valid, and it hurts. It sucks that you're being rejected, but like, you're good. You have people around you that love you and support you, and you deserve love. You're worthy of that. So anonymous, if you're listening, it does get better. I know it's a really cliche term, and I've said that on my other episodes. But it really, really does. Like getting through that pain and getting over that hump, like you're going to evolve as a person and you're going to be more authentically yourself. And when you're more authentically yourself, you're going to attract people who like you for you. And it'll be a lot easier. And it, it, you won't kind of hit those bumps of these people anymore because you were, I don't want to say that we were shells of our former selves, but we weren't our full selves. And our full selves were below the surface so people were only seeing that part of ourselves. And so it, it's, it, you're going to hit some bumps in the road when you are kind of being, when you're being true to yourself. And it, it's, it's really hard when you're in that period because it's lonely, but just know that like we've been through that before. And a lot of people in the community have been that, that way before. And um, something that you had said, Alexis, on one of your TikToks was that you never thought that you'd be able to be making gay content like five years ago, that you'd be this out and proud about it. And I feel the same fucking way. And I, I felt this was a year ago, uh, or not a year, about two years ago in 2018, when I was going through, I was really depressed and I was going through this huge transition. And I just thought just being out in public with a girl was like, an insurmountable obstacle and here I am making TikToks and interviewing other queer creators and talking and it, it it's it's such a process that literally gave me goosebumps it's it's like it's just yeah. so freeing it's so freeing. Yeah. Like, looking back five years ago oh man it's it's just insane I was I was scared to even post a picture on Instagram of mm-hmm. me and my girlfriend standing next to each other you yeah. know or like yeah, scared yeah. of dressing too gay or anything like that because Completely. I was so scared of like being who I was but like to now be able to post on TikTok and uh it's it's so freeing it's so cool when I came out I started wearing like tomboy stuff stuff that I wore when I was little you know when (laughs) I was growing up playing soccer I was always a tomboy and I kind of went reverted back to my authentic self which was a fucking tomboy um yeah so I get that so great yeah totally for sure crazy but But yeah, Anonymous, thank you so much for that question. I hope that we were able to help you out a little bit with our experiences. Speaking of sports, how was that experience coming out in college um, as an athlete? I ran cross country and track and uh, you spend a ton of time with your teammates. Like your practice with your teammates, half the time you have classes with them, Yep. um, locker room, everything. They're their friends you hang out with on the weekends. I remember my freshman year. So, so for cross country, we get in vans and we travel out to the back roads to run just because there's not enough. I mean, running in the city is not great. So I remember we were in the van and we were going out to a run. And one of my teammates, she was like, I don't even know if the statistic is real, so don't quote me on this. But she was like, you know, one in every four people are gay. So she was like, that means there's someone in this van that's gay. <laughs> I wasn't out then. And so I, I remember immediately blaming this other girl. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's totally Steffi. Like, Steffi, you're the gay one. And so all of us were like blaming this other girl. Like, yeah, you're gay. You're totally gay. And in my head, I'm over like, I just had a girl over last night. They have no idea that it was me. And so I remember after that, just being like terrified of coming out um because even the guys too they made jokes and stuff and there there was one girl on the team that was openly out and she was a lot older but they're like oh yeah when she when she graduates he's gonna be the new token gay of the of the team I was like scared in that sense I remember we all kind of reminisced on that time in the van we're like it was you (laughs) it was you um but yeah I think I think it's it can be weird um just because you do have locker a locker room you are showering in said locker room and so I always had this fear that my teammates were going to think I was looking at them or I had an attraction to them and so which was not the case if, if any of my teammates are listening I did not have a crush on any of you um, <laughs> but they'll throw you under the bus and pretend that it's not her that's gay but she won't look at you in the shower <laughs> yeah 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 hey that's fair right 
I love how you blamed it on a girl named Steph because I feel like all the Stephs are like all the Stephs I know are like are gay. I swear to God, or they, or I think they're gay. I I completely get where you're coming from with the locker room thing because I felt the same way, and I had I didn't come out in college. I came out to myself in college, like when I was 21. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't like come out out until I was like 20 or till like three, almost three years ago. Um, and so I remember this specific situation because we didn't really do locker room stuff in high school, but like in college when you're traveling, like everyone showers and everything like that. And I remember like everyone was like not really caring, like everyone was naked and they didn't really care to like have a sports bra or anything when they were showering. And I was like completely the opposite. I was like, I have a sports bra on, like I have like everything, <laughs> like I have my underwear on. Um, I just did, was not comfortable with that at all. I mean, I had a conservative upbringing, A, and B, I was repressed, closeted gay. And I literally could not look at anybody. And, and I wondered, and I was literally like, why am I so nervous? It must be because of my conservative upbringing because everyone else seems to be really fine. Like they're just cool. Like they're just showering. And I was <laughs> fucking mortified, fucking mortified. Like first away game, you're a freshman in college and college athletics are, you know, scary. And there's a lot of pressure and stuff like that. And I literally waited until everybody was gone, or at least I thought everybody was gone. And I go to take my shower and the, one of the coolest girls on the team was who I still like, like to this day. And like, we still like, we'll catch up sometimes literally came in just a butt ass naked right next to me. Like the same one. I'm like, you couldn't have gone like a few feet away. Starts a conversation with me as I'm trying to shower by my fucking self. And she's just here, you know, she's just all over. Like she, you know, <laughs> the hippie and she goes, how are you liking, are you liking the team? Like, has it, has it been like a really good experience for you? And I'm just sitting here like, like I, can't, I can't make eye contact with her, but now I feel awkward for not making eye contact with her. Like, what do I do? Like, I just look straight at her face, you know? <laughs> and so I was just like, yeah, it's really good. Like, I, I'm really enjoying it. Like, just like, sh like, please, like put some fucking clothes on. It's, uh, yeah, especially once I came out, like showering was weird. Cause I was like, I don't want them to think that like, I'm looking at them. Like, so it was, I, I told it, yeah, it, it's weird. It's definitely weird. Yep. <clears throat> it's, it's, it is. And like, I had that conversation when I came out to like my two best uh, girlfriends and they had known me for over 10 years. And I was like, you know, I was like crying and I was like, I don't want you guys, like if we have sleepovers to so, like think that like you can't undress in front of me. And they looked at me and they were like, Brie, we've, we would never think that. Like, why are you so concerned? Like nothing's changed. And yeah. it, like, it was such a huge like thing for me when I first came out was like, I was afraid that like straight women would be scared and would not be uncomfortable because of this predatory lesbian thing, this whole like stereotype that came about just that was so anti-gay and that like, like lesbians are predators. Like lesbians are not predators. Lesbians are scared. Lesbians are scared of yeah. women and they'll just stare at you. That's all they'll do. They'll just stare at you from across the room and ask you if you like girl in red. For some reason, people get this misconce misconception that being lesbian means you like all women you know yeah and and where you know you know we have our preferences every girl okay. that walks down the street I'm not attracted to um, and so it's like the same thing I always have to explain that to my my like friends I'm like okay see you you like certain types of guys like you click with certain guys every guy you come across you're not attracted to mm -hmm. I'm the same yeah I am the exact same yep and so yeah for some reason that gets like misconstrued a lot I feel um, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And I don't know, I don't know why it gets misconstrued. Like I've tried to think why, like people just think that like when women are gay, they're just into everyone, but like, cause everyone has their preferences. Like even when I was trying to be straight, I still had my preferences. They were just like really picky and barely able to be met. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like really picky. Like I just like I'm really picky with guys. I just like yeah. I'm really picky and I like to take things slow and like I just like to make sure. Yeah, no, that that like hits on such a deep level. I remember in high school one of my best friends, she told me cuz in high school you know I tried dating guys and stuff and she said to me, she was like, "Lex, the the one person you date and you have feelings for them for over a month, that's the one." And I was like, <laughs> I was like, and then once I like came out, I was like, dude, I didn't have feelings for more than a month because I was gay. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't the issue. It was, it was 
you know, the fact that they were men. We're saying that like you would get impatient if things didn't come easy to you. And that's how it was for me too, because I was always like a big overachiever. I was a scholar athlete, like anything that I did, like I was usually pretty good at it. And if I wasn't good at something, like I, I got pissed about it. I was just like a little baby about it. Um, and so kind of being in that overachieving space, like people were, were not um, surprised that I was so picky. Like they didn't think anything of it, you know, they're like, oh, she wants somebody on par. She wants somebody on par with her. Like, oh, oh yeah. And I was like, yeah, I just am really, you know, I just want somebody who can handle me. Yeah. <laughs> to, you know, all the listeners that are listening, if they're newly out or kind of in those beginning to middle stages, um, you had done some videos just talking about toxic relationships and things like that. Um, what were your kind of experiences around like, coming out and you know in college and kind of having to redo those dating years and kind of find yourself and kind of you know your self-worth and like what you deserved in relationships so coming out when you first experience you know being in love for the first time and finally feeling these things that you you thought you should have felt you know your whole life while you're dating, while still, well, for me, when I was experimenting with guys, like not feeling that and finally feeling that for the first time, um, it's very easy to get consumed in it. Uh, it's so easy to, to, you know, spend all your time there, put all your energy into it. Um, and I think one of the biggest things I learned is that, especially with my last relationship, we did not have good boundaries. Um, we did everything together. Uh, and for example, girls nights, I've had girls nights with my, my friends. Um, if I were dating a guy, there would, there's no reason for my boyfriend to be at girls nights. And I kind of think you kind of have to set those same boundaries with your girlfriend. Um, cause it's so easy to, to be like, Hey, you're a girl too. Like come to girls night. Um, and it's so easy to kind of get consumed in that and not have your boundaries and not have your own things. And so it became, it became overwhelming. It became toxic. Um, we had this dependency on each other. Um, my friends were annoyed because they never got to spend time with just me. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you first kind of hop into a relationship like that, it's so important to set boundaries and be like, Hey, you have your own hobbies. You have your own interests. You have your own friends. It doesn't mean that we can't mesh them sometimes, but we do need to have our own thing. And, uh, and to, and to make sure your partner understands that doesn't mean I don't love you. That doesn't mean I don't want to hang out with you. It just means that like for our relationship to survive, we need to have other things. We need to have, be being, be fueled by other people, by other interests. We can't only have each other. Um, so that was the biggest thing in my relationship is it became very toxic in the sense that it became our norm. So anytime I wanted to do one-on-one -on -one things with other people, uh, she would get very offended and, and didn't like me being friends, having friends one-on-one, -on -one. Um, didn't like me traveling without her. Um, and, I, and so it became very toxic. I, could, I felt like I could, I could not have my own thing. Um, my life had to be her. And I think that's partly why the breakup was so horrible um, is because I created a dependency for three years and to see her thrive without me um, and for me to have lost connection with all of these things that were once important in my life, um, gosh, that heartbreak was horrible. I, cause I had to re-figure out who I was because she had became my whole world. Um, so yeah, it's so important. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. They're so important and it's good to set right off the bat. And when you have that first girlfriend, you're going to feel like, man, they are everything. You want everything to be them, uh -huh. but just, just remember boundaries 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 <laughs> I love that and like comparing yourself to um to your your straight friends because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times you have to remember that me coming out at 20 means I didn't have 20 years of experimenting with girls and getting my heart broken by girls where my friends who are also at 20 had been in love with men had you know had gone through heartbreak and so when you know, if you're like 28 and you're gay and you came out when you're 20, like you, you got to remember, you only have had eight years of experience under your belt. 
And so don't compare, like, why am I not married? Why am I still single? Like, why don't I have kids? You know, stuff like that. Just you got to remember our timelines are different and that we didn't have 20 years of, of, you know, being open and and dating and being okay with that. So um, that whole comparison thing with, yeah, with your, your straight friends and their relationships. I love that. I'm a hoe for boundaries. Current hoe. I'm having a hoe phase for boundaries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for sure. You can have a hoe phase and then you can have a hoe phase for boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Hey, both are important for growth. Oh, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Even a couple hoe phases. I mean, it might not take one. Maybe you got to have two. Maybe you got to have three. I don't know. For sure. But I totally agree with you on that. I had had a similar um, experience. I think it's just this like lesbian urge to merge. I, it's so, the connection between two women is so deeply intimate and, and emotional and verbal as well as physical, and it comes on super fast. And if you're not careful, it can consume you and consume your identity. And you're, you're not a separate person anymore. You're one person. And that happened to me in my first relationship. I had a year and a half relationship and that ended about five months ago. And that happened to me too. And I am an independent person. Like I've always been independent. Like I've never been that kind of person. And and that it just goes to show like it can happen to anybody. Like love is a crazy fucking drug. It's nuts. It makes you do crazy shit. That's why there's so many lesbians that have relationships with people 5,000 miles away. Like it just, oh my God, (laughs) it's like ridiculous. And I, you might have had this too, where like you were hanging out with them, not because it was deliberate, but because like it was just what you did by default. So like you're hanging out with them all the time. It wasn't like I'm deliberately hanging out with you or deliberately having dates. Like sometimes that, that for my relationship, that just kind of like faded and like we just kind of relied on each other solely and didn't have any other support systems around. And also like setting boundaries, if you don't do it from the offset, can be seen as like, oh, you don't love me enough or like, like abandonment stuff or like you don't want to hang out with me. So then there's insecurities that can be at play why it's like so important to set them from the start totally yeah couldn't have said it better myself it's also hard I think like I felt like because it was my first serious relationship I wanted to be a good girlfriend and to be a good girlfriend I had to drop everything all the time for whatever reason to be there because I made a commitment and I was being loyal and so I had all these beliefs of what it was to be a good girlfriend and after the breakup I realized like I had worked so hard to do that, but I was actually kind of doing the opposite. I was enabling and I was, you know, she, I remember just like feeling like she was making decisions, not for herself and her own well being, but for me, because that's what I wanted for her, which obviously I wanted it for her, but I wanted her to want it, you know? And now looking back, I realize setting boundaries is being a good girlfriend, you know, taking time for yourself to recharge is good because if not, you could start fights and get frustrated because you don't have time for yourself. Yeah. And when you start like sacrificing huge parts of yourself, like sacrificing friendships, um, sacrificing opportunities because they don't want you to leave you or leave them. Um, you start to become bitter. Mm-hmm. And, and if you're not doing those things for yourself, you're going to have this bitterness and this like, I don't know, this like, yeah, this bitterness toward this person when, when, yeah. like you say, being, being a good girlfriend is taking that for yourself so that you can then be be a better individual for for your person and so yeah boundaries man so important Mm -hmm. yeah boundaries are the shit and even if you guys are in a relationship and you don't feel like it's toxic or like you maybe think that toxicity has to be like verbal abuse or physical abuse like something that's like super alarming it, it's not always that blatant. Um, and, I, and I don't know if I want to label my past relationship as toxic per se. Um, I don't know what kind of degree like a toxic relationship is or if it was just like an incompatible thing. Um, maybe you can speak to this. But, and also maybe it's because I I still think she's a good person and I don't have any bad blood with her. And that's why I don't think that it was toxic, but 
I don't know. Do you think that those kind of things, like just the codependency and the loss of self, we would consider toxic? Or would you just consider that like just bad boundary setting and incompatibility and just like kind of more of immaturity? Um, I think it really depends the context of the relationship. Uh, for me personally, I do label it as toxic because there was a lot of manipulation, um, in in the sense of like, like, for example, I, I was given a really good opportunity with my work to travel to different MLB stadiums and do really cool stuff, cool work on these stadiums. Um, and when I presented it to her, she made me feel as if, um, she would say stuff like, oh, well, well, what am I going to do? Why, why don't I have these opportunities? Um, it made me feel really guilty about leaving um, to where I turned down some opportunities. And that, and that was just one story of many um, in terms of that, like it was a lot of manipulation uh, to get me to center my focus on her and not, not be content doing stuff that I found was important. So I, I really do think it, it really depends on the context of the relationship. And sometimes it could just be, man, we did not set boundaries. And that was mm-hmm. <laughs> probably bad on <laughs> us. It was probably bad on both of us. Um, and yeah, but I do feel like I was kind of in a toxic situation because I was constantly feeling guilty and constantly being manipulated to do things that I would not have done in my own right mind. Um, and for people that are in this situation, I think it's so important to listen to the people around you. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, while I was in the relationship, I would tell myself, it's fine. It's fine. We just love each other. She loves me. She wants like, she just wants me to be with her. Like it's, it's fine. And in my head, I was like, there's nothing wrong with this. But around me, my sister was telling me, dude, this is like toxic. It's not cool. My best friends were telling me it. Um, and I just had my ears shut. I was like, I'm not listening to you guys. Like, um, so I think it's so important. The people around you, they know you the best. Your family knows you best. If you're, if you're on good terms with them, like your friends, your peers, your, your people know you. And so when your people are telling you there's something going on, there's something probably going on and try to listen, be receptive, you know? Yeah. Cause if I were, if I were to have been receptive, I would have saved a year and a half of my life. <laughs> so. <laughs> I can, I definitely feel that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I never, I don't know if mine was to that extent. I think it was more unintentional uh, manipulation. Um, I, I feel like she didn't intend to do certain things, but I definitely felt guilty for a good majority of the relationship as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with, you got to listen to the people around you. Like when I would say certain things, like it's not that they saw things and were like, Hey, red flag. It was me being like, um, this kind of happened. And then, you know, like my mom would be like, huh, that's probably not good. Like, but, and then I would have like a million excuses, but it's like, she's just going through a really hard time. And she's just, mm-hmm. and she's like, mm, I don't know, you know, like, yeah, those kind of things. And if I, and you kind of like, I feel like when you are in that situation, you kind of start to realize it and then you need assurance. You're like, okay, like I'm having these thoughts, like I'm considering like a breakup. And then once you get that reassurance, if you're considering a breakup, you're probably going to break up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. If you're considering it, it's going to happen. And if it doesn't, then like there's something at, that's keeping you in that relationship that's, that's negative, whether that's like insecurity, fear of loneliness, codependency. What will I do without this person? Because our lives are pretty much the same fucking life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get it. And I, and I did too. I had that where I felt that sense of loss, like, um, and while it didn't take me quite as long as it took, uh, you, it, I think it was because I, I initiated it and I had been thinking about it for a while and I had started Mm -hmm. to pull away, even though I, I didn't realize it then I was doing that. And so, yeah, I had been pulling away for some time and I remember thinking to myself and being like, oh, well, if I break up with her, like, her friends are my friends. And even though I have my own friends, my own friends are super busy. So like if I break up with her and I don't have anything to substitute that time with, it's just me going to work, coming home and eating a bland spaghetti dinner by myself. And I also felt 
she had all of she had friends that were queer and i only have one queer friend which i love her shout out uh chelsea um but she was also in a relationship and lived an hour and a half away um so like I, she had that queer community that i had always wanted to have and i knew that if i i wouldn't see them anymore if that happened and that was really sad because i loved i really liked her friends and i liked her siblings and so that can kind of, and it's funny when I think about it now, like I was literally being like, well, I really want to break up with her, but shit, like she had a lot of cool people around her. So like, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. it, it's weird when you think back and you're like, what the fuck? Like that was even a, a choice. Like it was a, even like a decision that I made. Like it should have just been a no from the jump. Um, yeah. It's for sure hard though. When you go through a breakup, you, you are breaking up with their family and friends as well. Kind of in a sense. Um, but I think one of the biggest tips, um, so after, after my breakup, I was pretty screwed up and, um, started going to like therapy and all that. Um, one of the greatest things my therapist told me and something that I always give to, to my friends when they're going through breakups is when you go through a breakup, you are taking a piece of your life away. So, so you're taking someone you spent a lot of time with, um, you're removing pictures from the wall. Uh, stuff like that. And so she said, whenever you take something away, you need to replace it. So if you take a picture off the wall, put a poster there, put a new photo with your friends. Um, if you're taking away uh, an activity you used to do, replace that with a new activity that, that you would do yourself um, or with friends. Just make sure that when you're taking something away, you're not leaving it empty, but you're replacing it. Um, and that was a huge thing for me because she was such a huge part of my life. She was my everyday, like, I hardly went to the bathroom without her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so guess who comes to the bathroom with me now? Cricket, my dog. <laughs> you substituted the, uh, your bathroom assistant for a girlfriend for Cricket. <laughs> yeah, and it's the best substitution. So, um, but yeah, in, in all seriousness, this note, like, for sure. Just make sure you're, you're taking care of yourself. You're replacing that stuff. You're not leaving it empty just because it's so good for your mental health and for your healing to, to have other things and not just to like sit in your loneliness and sadness. Um, but it is important to also grieve that relationship. You've got to remember that this is someone you spent time with, someone you love. And I saw a quote once that says, nothing is more painful than grieving someone who's still alive. Um, but it's so important to try not to jump into a relationship. Let yourself feel feels um, hurt and heal because uh, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. be so much stronger after that. That's perfect. I love that. I agree with that completely. It's really hard to not jump from one thing to another or like some people are kind of have something lined up where like they didn't even kind of realize it, but like things were kind of going south. And so they kind of like, you know, had someone else in the cooking in the works. Um, and honest to God, like if you do that, like may, it, it will mitigate the pain, but it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, using something to numb your emotions, but it's, they're still going to be there regardless. So like if you put in the work and like deal with that raw pain outright, like you're going to grow and be better and you're going to have better partners after, and you're going to have better experiences after. Um, I said that's on another podcast, but like, we're all fucking like dating to like, like figure out what we like and don't like and evolve as creatures. So, you know, if that's what you're looking for is to find like a, your soulmate, your partner, your whatever, um, you want and a person like this is it. And so if, if you feel like you're in this, I'm constantly dating toxic people. I'm constantly dating people that, you know, cheated on me. Like you got to look and see like, like what? like, what are we doing here? Like, am I, am I growing out of this or am I kind of repeating the same cycles? Um, mm -hmm. and we've definitely all been through that. So totally. Yeah. So that was really good advice. I, I, when I had a breakup, I guess I inadvertently substituted things like not like specific, like pictures or something like that. I had put up new things later, but I chose the, to do the, like, I chose to a lot my time after work to certain activities that I had wanted to do with her. I was like, Oh, I want to, I want to have, you know, active, I want to do active activities with you. Like, can we hike or can we bike or can we work out together? Can we do this? 
And it, it just never worked out that way. But I was like, well, shit, like I'm going to do it on my own. Like I ended up taking MMA classes. Um, I was planning to coach soccer, which didn't end up because of COVID. I was going to coach my cousin. Um, I said yes to literally everything. So I was super booked up um, until COVID happened. But <laughs> I, I said yes to everything. And it was great. It was a good distraction. It, you know, I learned fucking MMA shit. Um, I was on a soccer team, like, you know, and then I finally had kind of found a couple queer people to then go out to bars and like kind of date and do that shit. Well, until COVID. Oh, that's so good. That's sweet. No, it's important to do for sure. All right. Lightning round. Alexis, you want to answer some questions really fast? Let's do it. Sweet. <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. Dog or cat? Dogs. Texting or talking on the phone? Uh, kind of the phone. Mm. Big spoon or little spoon? Ooh, <laughs> little spoon. I'm kind of little, so. Okay. <laughs> Favorite queer movie? The half of it. Flannels or Hawaiian shirts? Flannels. What the fuck? <laughs> no offense. Last song you listened to on repeat? Not Your Friend by Jeremy Zucker. Giving presents or getting presents? Am I allowed to say both? <laughs> you fucking switch. <laughs> <laughs> hey yeah I was I was uh alluding to that I was hoping the gays would hear that <laughs> <laughs> I mean we're basically all switches we just yeah, sometimes yeah. we have preferences that lean one or the other but first celeb you had a crush on who um Missy uh gosh what even is her last name the girl from Missy Stick Perry Grimm from <laughs> Stick It <laughs> for sure she she hit different she made me feel things I should not have felt at that age I was obsessed with fucking Stick It. I saw her and I didn't know if I wanted to be her. I was really confused. I thought I wanted to be her. But now looking back, I think it was both. Yeah. So, yeah, she had different. I always thought she was going to be gay for some reason. I know. I, I followed her on fuck? Instagram the other day and I was so disappointed to see she was with a man. <sighs> You're the biggest disappointment to the gay community. What a fucking waste. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I'd trade some of the gays for her, you know? <laughs> Can we substitute it? Yeah, sub, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Favorite queer character on a show or movie? Um, Alice from The L Word. Alice was, Alice was always getting herself into weird shit, and it was my favorite thing. Like, that, that episode when she, like, got with that vampire girl. <gasps> I was just about, I was just thinking that. <laughs> she was always getting herself into weird shit, and it was my favorite thing ever. That was awesome. I loved that hoe phase when she had that hoe phase with the vampire chick and she only saw her at night and she like legit thought she was a fucking vampire. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I have a funny vampire story. Let's hear it. I don't know if I'll keep it in. But um, I was in Denver and I, I, did, I was working online and I was working because I had done some traveling and anyways, um, I met up with some people that were doing the same thing and we were staying in Breckenridge and then we stayed in Denver and the hostel that my friend and I stayed in was hosting a vampire ball and this is like a subculture of people who dress up like as like people that were like hundreds of years ago like Marie Antoinette and then there's like mythical creatures like there's just a lot of like stuff and there's that and then there's this whole like erotic kind of thing with like the uh, BDSM and it kind of merges into this ball. And this hostel was hosting like this meet and greet. And so they had the people that were there and then they obviously had like every other person that's at the hostel. So you have all of these people that aren't part of the ball um, at this meet and greet. And we're all just kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Like this, cause everyone is just decked out. You know, we have like fucking Captain Hook. There's like three Marie Antoinettes. There's like, these people that were like the succubi, succubus, and docubus, and like, I don't even know, um, and it, it was so funny, because like, all of us were kind of timid, we're just like, oh, fuck, like, we're just like vanilla motherfuckers, like, uh, <laughs> like, what's going on, and, um, there was a palm reader, I got my palm read by this one lady, and then I ended up seeing her later that night, and she goes, I sensed that you were in the room, and I was Whoa. like, that's fucking cool, I was into it, I was, like, <laughs> I was into it, <laughs> um, dang, but uh, yeah, so that happened, and they were like, hey, you should come to the ball, and I was like, sure, okay, and I mean, there was a girl there, and she asked me to come to the ball, and I said, okay, um, I'll make naturally. sure I'm there, yeah. um, <laughs> naturally, and we ended up like coming to it randomly, didn't even pay to get in, and it was this whole fucking thing 
where you had all of these people dressed up, like being themselves, like there was like kind of the BDSM stuff, but obviously it wasn't like completely like sexual in nature. Mm -hmm. um, you had somebody who hung from a cross. They hung like a Virgin Mary from a cross and like fucking like in the middle of the fucking room. And you had flamethrowers and like people on like just like Lero dancers. Um, it was really neat. It was really neat to see this kind of subculture that comes together every February. Yeah. And uh, it, it, people with fangs, like I got bit a couple times, the fake fangs. It was really, yeah. it was the weirdest shit. <laughs> I was in, I mean, I was into it. It was cool. Like, I would go again, and I would, like, yeah. dress up, probably. Oh. <laughs> That's how we're going to end this podcast. <laughs> that was a nice little segue. That was a bit by the Vampire Queen. <laughs> hey, yo. Thank you so much for being on this podcast, Alexis. If you want to check out more about her, you can find her on TikTok and Instagram at Alexis Leanna. Okay. And as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on Apple Podcasts and leave us a little review. Helps us get discovered by more queer people just like you. Uh, that's it for this episode, Queers. Thank you for listening, viewing, subscribing. If you're not subscribed on Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button and follow us on Spotify. Uh, be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.